for about as long as I can remember, a significantly large part of the population has portrayed electric cars as playthings of the rich and the famous. They've portrayed electric cars as being only suitable for liberals living in major cities, and they've been portrayed as being limited range, limited performance, and limited appeal. For those in the know, those myths are easily dispelled. Electric vehicles are now as affordable, if not more, than a new internal combustion engine vehicle. They are practical, and as long as you're not trying to make a road trip up the Dalton Highway, they're pretty easy to drive both long and short distances. But city life? Hmm. If you're a city dweller, you should frankly forget about owning an electric car altogether. Or indeed, any type of car. Electric cars and modern cities don't work well together, and today I'm going to look at the history of using EVs as electric city transport, detail the reality of living in a major city with an electric car, and explain how, in the age of micromobility, we should be looking at other more sustainable and practical solutions for zero emission city transit and explain why, if you live in a city, you should probably forget car ownership altogether. Oh, and I'll throw in some ideas as to how city planners could make the future of electrified urban transport a lot rosier too. The idea of electric cars being primarily for use in cities goes back a really long way. Back to the dawn of the automobile, in fact. But there's a good reason for that being the case. The earliest electric cars were primarily used in urban areas, and while some enterprising folks took it upon themselves to travel outside of cities and make incredibly long-distance trips, both in electric and internal combustion engine cars, Bertha Benz, of course, being the first, the majority of our car trips were short jaunts between nearby towns or around larger cities. The practicalities of travel were to blame. A horse and carriage could find food and water pretty much anywhere, but buying fuel for early internal combustion engine vehicles first required finding a chemist, a hardware store or a blacksmith and hoping they had the right petroleum-based fuel in stock. For electric vehicles, you of course needed electricity, which was of course more readily available in cities than it was in rural areas. By 1900, electric cars were so popular in New York City that one third of all vehicles on the road were electric. The city had a fleet of electric taxis and people preferred them because they didn't have the noise of gasoline or steam, didn't require fettling every time you wanted to get in and go, and had up to 100 miles of range per charge. Yet, aside from highly publicised marketing stunts, like the 1,800-mile, 20-day expedition from Lincoln, Nebraska to New York City, as made by Oliver O. Fritchell in a two-seat Fritchell Electric Model A Victoria Phaeton, most early vehicles, both electric and gasoline, didn't venture far outside the city. Of course, there were trailblazers. But it wasn't really until the birth of the Ford Model T that everyday folks even contemplated owning a car, let alone driving far beyond the city limits. For those who actually did, the roads were pretty terrible. In 1919, long after the Model T Ford had begun to transform the affordability of private motor vehicle ownership, a young lieutenant in the United States Army by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower took part in the first US Army transcontinental motor convoy, reporting that travelling from Washington DC to San Francisco, California took 62 days. I suspect that experience influenced his decision later in life as the 34th US president to establish the US interstate system. But I digress. The Model T and the oil boom of the teens and 20s sounded the death knell for the early electric car. But when electric cars resurfaced during multiple fossil fuel crises, the majority of electric cars being designed were built specifically for urban travel. They were small and compact for the most part, designed to eke out as much range as possible from as little charge as possible. They were frugal, designed for short city commutes or for commutes from suburbia to and from the local city centre. They had small ranges, small wheels and... 
unique styling. Of course, there were exceptions to this rule, and Kate Walden Elliott would kill me if I left one in particular out. The Mars 2 of 1968 was based on a Renault R10 and was an EV with not only highway-capable top speeds, but regenerative braking, a range of between 70 and 120 miles, 112 to 193 kilometers, and the ability to use dedicated DC quick charging to refuel at special DC quick charging stations in just 45 minutes. Yet still, the perception of EVs as city cars persisted. Even today, with modern long-range battery packs and onboard DC quick-charging capabilities, many commentators and customers look at EVs as cars just for those who live in major cities. Except that's not the case. And frankly, it hasn't been for ages. Electric cars might be the perfect suburban choice, where EV ranges are more than enough to get you in and out of a major city with zero tailpipe pollution and zero range anxiety for as low a cost as possible. And as we discussed in a recent video on this channel, modern long range EVs now make it possible to own an EV in a rural location. But city dwelling is becoming increasingly more troublesome for any car owner, more so for EVs, and even in large suburban areas, EVs are becoming a less smart choice if you don't own your own home. The first challenge is, of course, the fact that it's unusual today to find a home in a major city with included off-street parking, let alone off-street charging. While rapid DC charging means that you can now have an EV and use quick charging almost exclusively to refuel, there simply aren't enough DC quick charging stations to go around. And even if you can find a place to recharge, the premium charged by most rapid charging networks, from Tesla's supercharger network to Electrify America, Ionity and more, mean that you're paying so much of a premium on electricity that even petrol starts to look more appealing. Using rapid charging on a trip is okay. Using it every few days just to keep on the road is not. That's doubly so if you're then having to pay a set amount every month for a permit parking or space, or God forbid, you actually just have to rely on metered parking on your street. Those who don't own their own home are often at a disadvantage in this case. While nobody can easily own an EV in an inner city, those who aren't homeowners often struggle further out, with the majority of apartment complexes failing to offer garages or parking with EV charging provision included. Of the two people who rent at this channel and live in rental properties, one has to get creative to charge at home, while the other has to rely on charging a long way from home. And it's only getting worse. More and more parking spaces in inner cities are being developed into modern apartment complexes. City streets are becoming more and more congested as people from suburbia opt to take cars rather than public transit in the world of COVID-19. And that's not even to mention the fear of enclosed spaces that people are now developing from the spectre of monkeypox. And having taken more than 90 minutes to cross five miles of Manhattan in a taxi the other week, I can tell you that owning an electric car, or in fact any car, is just not practical without some significant changes to how city traffic is managed. Which brings me to the solution. A massive need for reinvestment in public transit, more car share services and legislation that makes micromobility not only a possibility, but actively encouraged. Let's deal with them in order. Public transit first. While many of the world's largest cities have a reliable, fast metro, underground or light rail system, there's a definite lack of standardization around the world as to what is considered normal and what's considered acceptable when it comes to service levels. Because most of our major cities are still designed with cars in mind, even London, where private cars are heavily discouraged from entering the dueling cities of Westminster and London, Large amounts of money is spent just repairing road surfaces and keeping a status quo in effect. 
The older a city is, of course, the more likely its road network has to contend with constraints from the original road planners. New York, Philadelphia, Paris and Rome, among many others, all have to deal with the knock-on effects of cities primarily built and expanded before private automobile ownership was what it is today. Newer cities, not so much. Worse still, in many major cities, bus routes aren't given the priority or right-of-way that they would need to become a more viable alternative solution. This is particularly true in North America, where buses have to contend with regular traffic on an everyday scale. It is better in some parts of Europe, where bus routes are more likely to have dedicated lanes, and in case of some cities, dedicated expressways that are solely built and designed for bus use. There's a whole collection of them in the UK, if you're interested. While the majority of these are designed to get people into and out of the city to park and ride locations further out, there's no reason why a similar solution couldn't be deployed in more cities around the world for inner city travel. And with those kind of dedicated routes come the opportunity to offer trolleybus overhead power cables, meaning zero emission electric mass transit that doesn't need to be recharged overnight without the usual expense of installing a traditional rail or tram system. Congestion charging private cars is one way to ease the demand on inner city streets, which would encourage citizens to take public transit and forget about car ownership. And that in turn means that city streets can be redesigned to take advantage of less congested traffic, handing over more space to pedestrians, micromobility users and public transit. I want to come back to city design in a second, but first let's come to the idea of car sharing schemes. Because one of the reasons many people continue to try and own a car, electric or otherwise, when they live in a densely populated city is the desire or need to be able to go wherever they want, whenever they want. But the actual instances of them needing to do that may be countable on just one hand every week. That said, because it's there, people continue to try and privately own a car, which is where car clubs and ad hoc car sharing comes in. It allows city dwellers to get to where they need to go regardless of the time of day without needing to wait for public transit without actually owning a car themselves. And a study into free floating car sharing in 11 European cities in 2020 Free floating means cars are parked wherever there are spaces at the time rather than relying on a dedicated parking base, showed that each share now car being operated by BMW at the time replaced up to 20 privately owned cars. Or to put it another way, five car sharing vehicles replacing 100 privately owned cars. Encouraging people to dump the pump and forego private ownership of an EV in major cities becomes far easier if there is significant reliable and affordable public transit matched with significant car share car club programs. But I suspect I know where some of you are heading in the comments. What about all of those autonomous vehicles? Elon Musk's goal of autopilot to have a fleet of fully autonomous robo-taxis not to mention similar service goals from companies like Cruise and Waymo, might be something you'd be tempted to argue would change our cityscapes in the not too distant future. But as each company working on autonomous vehicles has discovered time and time again, developing a robust, reliable autonomous vehicle AI for large cities is hard. Every city is different, every intersection is different, and that's before you even look at the differences in driving styles between, say, Los Angeles and Boston. Eventual robo-taxi services are great in principle, but it is our opinion that they're still a long way away, at least in terms of us pinning our hopes and dreams on them. So far, then, we have cities that need better, more reliable, more affordable mass transit. We have an electrification of existing mass transit that needs to happen. And we need carrots and sticks of discouraging private cars while simultaneously encouraging car share use. But at this point, we're still designing our cities around large vehicles, not small ones. And for many cities with temperate weather, micromobility could be the ultimate solution when paired with sympathetic city design.
we recently reviewed a small Chinese-built scooter that I personally used to allow me to park on the outskirts of Portland and then scoot in, avoiding high parking charges and congestion. Small, compact and easily recharged at an office desk, electric scooters, one wheels and other forms of e-mobility are joining more traditional electric bicycles as a great way to get around in places where the climate is generally temperate all year round. But like cycling, how popular those forms of transport are going to be depends greatly on the way in which roads are designed. Few people in their right mind would be content fighting with buses, trucks and massive SUVs for space on an overcrowded road. But in our hypothetical future world, where we've designed our city roads to be less congested through limiting private car use, we have a space to redesign roads, reserving space for both pedestrians and low-speed vehicles. And there are two particular ways that come to mind to do this. One would be to designate specific highways just for cyclists or low-speed electric vehicles. And there's a town in Georgia, for example, that has dedicated roads just for golf carts to use. Or you could set aside general traffic routes for micromobility. Head to many cities in the Netherlands and other parts of Europe and you'll see that in action. Removing the conflict between multi-ton boxes of metal and squishy humans on smaller wheeled contraptions encourages more people to ride. It reduces accidents and you create neighbourhoods where people are more likely to know each other, interact together and build a true community. But again, I suspect that some of you are going to say something about winter. In winter, it's neither practical nor fun to make those trips if there's snow and ice on the road. But here's the thing. If you treat cycleways and pavements just like you treat roads in winter, clearing them regularly from debris and making them clear and free from ice, you would be surprised how many people would still want to commute in colder weather. The Ottawa Gatineau area of Canada has been clearing pathways for cyclists now for a number of years, and it's actually helped increase the number of cycle commuters that use those roads even in the depths of winter. And of course, for warmer climates, planting trees can help shade multi use and dedicated paths in the summer months. So there you have it a pathway to a better city and one that doesn't need a single privately owned car. Would you entertain it? Do you already live without a car? And what are the challenges as you see them today? Leave your thoughts below. That's it for today's video. If you liked it, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send our way goes directly back into making great content. If you haven't already, please make sure that you have subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two, which is more behind the scenes stuff and give that bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire crew, go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of us who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here on my right hand side. And if your name isn't showing yet, be aware that we currently render the list every week or so. So sometimes our videos take a while to catch up with our list of patrons. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Moe-Pinheiro, Patrick Boyarski, Bernard Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Guido Tahota, Brophy Wolf, Tesla in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Asanta, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger and Denny Hyde. And out of this world, thanks to our Starman level supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobanak, Blue Cecilo, Kevin Boroughbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. If you'd like to be part of that list, it is super easy to do. You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. You could buy a t-shirt, just like the one I'm wearing right now. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it really makes a massive difference to our channel. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving.